Well, I'll say bless the Lord if you'll say, oh, my soul, bless the Lord. Bless his holy name. Seth Nerva, thank you guys so much. What, what a delight. Thanks for calling out things in us that need to be called out. Um, I'm Chris. I'm the pastor here. Uh, we want to be the kind of place that engages the whole person, the whole gospel, anywhere, anytime, with anybody, including myself. And sometimes uh, that leads us straight into the face of fear. Um, and I need to confess to you, one of my fears as a communicator of God's word and the gospel who tries to do it in passionate and creative ways is if I don't come out and make sure I have an incredible introduction, I'll lose half of you and we won't even be interested when we get into God's word. So that's one of my fears and I'm gonna face it tonight. So there's no introduction. If you'll open up your Bibles, we'll be in Luke chapter nine, starting in verse 23. We're gonna put the plow on the ground and see what happens. I'm gonna pray for us as you're turning there. Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Oh, Jesus, let us be fearless and faithful in the midst of doubt and uncertainty. Thank you that you did not promise us safety but significance. And I pray that you lead us deeper into that tonight. So Jesus, would you go before us in this text and make a way? And together we say, speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. Amen. Luke 9, we'll start in verse 23. Then he said to the crowd, if any of you wants to be my follower, yes, please, you must turn, I added that in case you're wondering, that's not a loosey-goosey translation. <laughs> you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world, but are yourself lost or destroyed? If anyone is ashamed of me and my message, then the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory, and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I'll say the word of the Lord if you'll say thanks be to God. The word of the Lord. Be to God. It's a great, awesome, straightforward, simple message. If you want to follow Jesus, you got to turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow him. Now, when I read stuff like that, it gets me really fired up, all right? I start to picture all the hundreds and thousands of men and women who have come before us, who that is not just a lyrical statement, that was a literal statement. They had to die for their faith. And that is inspiring and encouraging and convicting all at the same time. Mentally, I just kind of picture a dude like Polycarp, who was said uh, to be a disciple of John, the disciple of Jesus. He was the bishop of Smyrna in the early church. And in 159 AD, he rocked straight into the Roman Colosseum as all the men and women in the Colosseum chant, away with the atheist. They called Christians atheists back then because they denied the deity of anybody else except Jesus Christ, including the Roman emperor. And so the uh, judge there gives a chance to quiet the crowd. They have a fire and a stake being ready to be lit, and they're going to burn him at the stake, but they give him one last chance. They say, recount and revile Jesus Christ, and you can live. And here's what is recorded that Polycarp said. Eighty and six years I have served him, and he has done me no wrong. How then can I blaspheme my king and my savior? You threaten me with a fire that burns for a season, and after a little while is quenched. But you are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment that is prepared for the wicked. What does it profit to gain the whole world? And yet you yourself are destroyed. They would light the fire and ultimately, after he was dead, pierce him in the heart to make sure that he was dead. But some of his last recorded words as he was dying was a prayer in which he said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of the martyrs I may share in the cup of Christ. Do you ever wonder like me, that's incredible, I really doubt I would have what it takes in that moment 
to stand up for my faith that way? How did Polycarp get to a place where he could say such bold things in the face of death? I would submit to you, he had 86 years of practicing dying, of turning from his selfish way, of loosening his grip on the things that he wanted and turning towards the case of Christ. Now, I, 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 this is no shock to you guys. Um, I have an overactive imagination and deep-seated approval issues. So <laughs> as a kid, I, I would daydream a lot about being some awesome sports star who made the game-winning shot or touchdown, and everyone would give me all these adulations. I dreamt of being a famous actor, um, and then I surrendered to the call of ministry, and I put away childish things. Actually, I didn't. I just baptized all those daydreams <laughs> and thought, oh my gosh, I can be a famous Christian. And I would imagine things like gunmen would burst into this room and all you cowards in here would denounce Christ and I alone would stand up in the face of certain death. Muzzle would flash, I would slump, flag would be at half mast, and thousands of people would come to my funeral and they would cry and say how awesome I was. My wife would take a vow of celibacy for the rest of her life because <laughs> just as he's, he's Saint Christopher. And then one of you guys would go out and write a book about me, and that book would be turned into a movie. And I try to think, who's gonna play me, Kirk Hamlin or Nicolas Cage? Please, neither of them. <laughs> We've gotta have somebody better. <laughs> but I, as I dream about all those things, I, I long so long to, to live a significant life and to die a significant death, yet I really am afraid, do I have what it takes when the time comes? Fred Craddock is a preacher I told you about last week. He has a similar story about thinking about those things. Maybe it's preacher disease. Um, but he said this, I was waiting for the moment that would come where I would have to write one lump sum check with my life to give for the cause of Christ. And I kept asking myself, am I ready to do that? And fear and doubt and uncertainty would creep in. He said, but then soon I realized this. Living the Christian life was not writing one lump check once and handing it to God. It was every day waking up and writing a check for 55 cents. Waking up the next day, $1.25. Getting into the weekend, $5.55. Little, conscientious, seemingly insignificant, acts of service and suffering so that we deny our selfish ways, take up our cross, and follow him. My question for you tonight, is there a check God's asking you to write with your life that you're avoiding right now? Was there one today that passed you by and you just thought, I just don't have time, or I can't do that? I can't be that generous, I can't be that considerate. No, that would cause too much suffering and sacrifice for my own agenda. What are the small checks that we're consistently ignoring? And I wonder if we learned and practiced how to write those small checks every day, the day that the big check came due, we've been practicing our whole life. Now, to contextualize it for all my younger friends, a check is just written Venmo, okay? <laughs> like it's paper Venmo, that's what it is. We're good? Okay, great, we, we can continue. Uh, here's what's delightful about this text. All right? Jesus does not just give us this in incredible command and drop the mic and walk off the stage, right? He doesn't say, hey, if you want to follow me, turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross daily, and follow me. I'm done. End of gospel. And as much as I believe this statement, I just don't necessarily know if God does it, because a lot of times we say, well, God said it and I believe it. That's great. God says it, and then he gives us reasons why. And he's really, really good at that. He's not asking us to put our intellect on a shelf. He's actually asking us to count the cost, figure out the consequences, and make a faith-filled, rational decision because I know how humans flourish. So he's asking us to take up the cross daily. And you're like, what? Put an electric chair on our back? Like, what? that's really weird, Jesus. What are you talking about? That's only criminals. Uh, get executed that way, what, what's going on here? And he gives us three solid reasons. Hey, if you wanna keep your life, you need to lose it. Then he says, if you want 
um, to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. If you give it up for my sake, you'll actually save it. By the way, a lot of times we think it's selfish motivation to get saved. Actually, Jesus just justifies that right here. Hey, do you wanna save your life? Yes, please, okay, then lose it for my sake. Deal, done. And then he says, if you're ashamed of me and you reject me here and now, when I come back, I will be ashamed of you and reject you. Okay, don't want that consequence. All right, taking up your cross daily sounds great. Thank you very much, Jesus. I don't know if I have it all in me. I don't know if I'm gonna have enough money in the bank account tomorrow. I don't know if my obedience can cash the checks that my faith is writing, but I'm in and I'm with you. Here's the deal. Jesus reminds us here, men and women, we've got two choices. You can go your own way or you can go the way of Jesus. Those are your only two options. Just so we're clear, both of them lead to death. Only one promises resurrection and life everlasting. You pick. There's no middle ground. There is a way that leads to death and there is a way that leads to life. And if you want your life, let go of it. But it's difficult, isn't it? I don't know about you, I'm a fearful and a fickle creature most times. I can choose this one day and something else the next day. And what's really disheartening sometimes is how when I find something that is tangible and tactile and right in front of me, and whether it's God's way or not, if it promises just a little bit of safety and security, I'll snatch it. A little bit of intimacy and purpose, I'm in. A little bit of comfort and convenience because I'm tired of carrying my cross. Suffering and sacrifice isn't always where I wanna live, and I snatch it and I grab it. And when I get a hold of it, I literally sometimes squeeze those things to death and that's usually exactly what I get, is death. Because I can't let go of my selfish, self-centered, self-aggrandizing ways to open up my hands and receive the power and the providence of Jesus to follow him. Have you guys heard of this? Um, it's called, uh, wait, I better get this pronunciation right, South Indian Monkey Trap. Have you guys ever heard of this before? Um, I just found out about it. Full disclosure, I don't know if this is real or not. All right, I don't know if it's lyrical or literal. Either way, it proves a great point, so let's just go along for the ride. In South India, apparently, there's mischievous monkeys who go into the villages, they steal all their food. So the villagers uh, designed this trap, and what it is is they grab a coconut, they hollow it out, and they put a hole in this one side. Now, the hole is small enough so that the monkey can fit his hand through. The other side is attached to a rope or a chain and then a pole. What they'll do is they'll dump sweet rice inside the coconut. But what they've done is they've made the hole small enough so that he can cram his greedy little hand through there. But the second he scoops up that rice and his fist expands, he can't pull it out. And do you know, <laughs> there we go, great. If there's a painting, that means it's real. Okay, uh, it was discovered sometime. Look it up on Wikipedia, it's legit. They grab it and they can't pull it out and possibly one of the things that's ingrained in a monkey since birth is there is scarcity of food. So the second you see it, you grab it and you don't let go of it. But for some reason, his brain cannot process the new context that the very thing that he thought was going to bring life, if he held on to it, will now bring imprisonment and death. And what you guys have realized is the one thing that he's not realized. There is no physical barrier to his entrapment. All he has to do is let go, and he's free. So that's why I think the Lord brought you here tonight. What is it that you're hanging on to? And if you let go, the Lord will free you. What is it? Is it sweet rice? Is it sour rice? Is it bitterness? Is it resentment? Or is it a pleasure of sin for a short time that you snatch and you just can't let go? You want to take up your cross and you want to follow him, but for some reason you've got a death grip on it and now death has a grip on you. What would it look like tonight for you to let go and live? Hey, and I know that's hard. And that's why Jesus has modeled that for us. Scripture tells us that he was fully God in the heavens and that he humbled himself and emptied himself. 
He let go of his full, raw, unrestrained power and glory so that he could be found in the form of a man. Jesus let go of his life and he took up the cross so that he could show us how it was done. And then after he was dead and buried for three days in the grave, he let go of that grave and those grave clothes. And he got out and showed us what resurrected life really looks like. And it's in those moments I'm reminded of that old hymn. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, <laughs> all fear is gone. And I know, oh, oh, he holds the future. <laughs> and life is worth the living just because he lives. What do you need to let go of tonight so that you can truly live? Amen.